I was so I was so smart when I was a kid that I learned that I was dumb. We are at war now. Hearts, let's bleed. Why don't we just cut ourselves and just die? It feels so bad. It was the peak of the war. You're all right, man. Can't save your life. It's not mine. I'm just another guy walking down the road. 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 This is only a couple hours. Can you imagine what it would be like a couple days with me? Some kind of Jesus is to the black Jesus down in Florida. He's having a good time. It's a consciousness that lives in your mind. What do you want to call me a murderer for? I've never killed anyone. I don't need to kill anyone. I think it. I don't care. A box car and a jungle wine. And a straight racer. If you get too close to it. You feel like moves from Bob Ruff Rennes? Get Fred is. 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 Get Fred Believe me, if I start murdering people, there'd be none of you left. My children are coming. I told you 20 years ago. Charlie probably never met his father. In 1934, Kathleen married William Eugene Manson, and Charlie acquired his surname. William was a heavy drinker and absent stepfather. He and Kathleen divorced in 1937, but Charlie kept his last name. Kathleen was also a heavy drinker and left Charlie at home alone often to fend for himself. Charlie also claimed later in life that his mother was very abusive towards him at this time, especially verbally. In 1939, Kathleen was involved in a robbery and received a 10-year prison sentence. Charlie went to live with his aunt and uncle in West Virginia until his mother was paroled in 1942. They reunited and Kathleen was still absent and abusive as a mother. By this time, Charlie began getting arrested and getting into lots of trouble himself. Due to this, Kathleen sent him to a Catholic school for juvenile delinquents called the Gabalt School for Boys. It was located in Indiana. Charlie fled the school on two separate occasions. The first, he returned to his mother and she sent him back. The second, Charlie fled to Indianapolis, where he rented a room and supported himself by robbing stores at night. He was eventually caught and sent to Boystown, 
another juvenile delinquent school in Omaha, Nebraska. Charlie was only at that school for four days when he and another child inmate stole a car and drove to Illinois. Charlie supported himself by committing more robberies, for which he was eventually caught by police. He was sent to yet another school for juvenile delinquents called the Indiana Boys School. In Indiana, obviously. Charlie claims that at this school, he was abused both physically and sexually. He attempted to escape twice and failed. In 1951, though, he was finally successful and escaped to commit more robberies and to eventually be caught again. See a pattern here? This time, Charlie was sent to Washington, D.C. to the National Training School for Boys. He was evaluated for psychological problems and was deemed to be aggressively antisocial. We will discuss that more later. In other words, Charlie was diagnosed a sociopath. Upon recommendations from Charlie's physicians, he was transferred to the National Bridge Honor Camp. In 1952, before his scheduled parole hearing, Charlie was caught raping another boy inmate at knife point. Charlie was transferred again due to this to the Federal Reformatory in Petersburg, Virginia. There, Charlie was caught committing several crimes against other boys. Eventually, he was sent to a maximum security facility in Ohio. Charlie has identified as bisexual, and in 2013, he admitted to raping a man in jail. In 1954, Charlie was 20 years old and was released to the custody of his aunt and uncle. In 1955, Charlie married a local waitress named Rosalie Jean Willis. For a brief time, he found honest employment and lived a quiet life. This would be the only time in Charlie's life where he had a somewhat normal life. Rosalie fell pregnant. She and Charlie wanted to relocate to Los Angeles. In order for the two of them to travel there, Charlie stole a vehicle. He was caught and sentenced to three years at Terminal Island, San Pedro, California. During his stay in prison, Rosalie met another man, fell in love, and wanted a divorce from Charlie. When he found out, he tried to escape and go see her. Who knows what his plans would have been? Luckily, he was caught trying to escape and then lost his chance at an upcoming parole. When Charlie was released in 1957, he became a pimp, a man who sold women in the sex industry for profit, human trafficking. He was caught, but not for being a pimp, no. He was caught for forging a U.S. Treasury check in the amount of only $43. He was arrested and given a 10-year suspended sentence and probation. As long as he didn't violate probation, he would remain out of jail. This was recommended by his probation officer, as seen here. Dear Mr. White, Pursuant to the recent conversations we had concerning the above young man, I am writing to give my views of him for your assistance in formulating your report to the court prior to his impending sentence. Manson has been in almost continuous custody since the age of eight. He is the product of a most unfortunate family background, and it is doubtful if even his mother knows the identity of his actual father. His mother has herself an unfavorable history, and during this boy's infancy served a five-year sentence for assault and drunk rolling. She has been an alcoholic for many years, and Manson, as a child, was subjected to all the vicissitudes such a home atmosphere inflicts. It is understandable that he became delinquent at an early age, and I believe was first committed to a custodial institution when eight years old. I have not recently studied the record in detail, but I believe this is the 13th custodial institution of which he has been an inmate during his short span of life. Despite the unsavory history outlined above, I believe there is a possibility this young man may yet be salvaged. He is not a mental deficient, he is a good appearance, and he has demonstrated at time a very real determination to attain a normal way of life. He is emotionally undeveloped and twisted, and his reaction 
to situations of stress have often been juvenile. However, I do not believe this young man will achieve emotional maturity in an institutional setting. In fact, I believe he is over-institutionalized at the present time and that a lengthy period of incarceration would only serve to accentuate the unfavorable aspects of his case. Above all else, this man needs to learn to live in a normal manner and that is something he will not learn in an institution. I believe his recent escape attempt was merely another evidence of his unusual emotional reaction to a stressful situation. And with regard to his sentence, I would recommend that he be given only an extended period of probation to follow his present incarceration. Very truly yours, for the warden, T.R. Kittle, Chief Classification and Parole. Charlie and a woman who was working under him in the sex industry moved to New Mexico and began their illegal activities there. Charlie was arrested again and charged in Texas for violating his probation. Due to his probation violation, he was sent back to Los Angeles to serve that 10-year suspended sentence. In July of 1961, Charlie was transferred from Los Angeles County Jail to the United States Penitentiary at McNeil Island, Washington. Charlie spent his entire childhood and young adult life in jail or prison. He really wanted to create the family he never got to experience. He began learning how to form proper relationships and feed his ego using manipulation. At the same time, he longed to confront the society he hated so much and never felt he fit into. I was so, I was so smart when I was a kid that I learned that I was dumb. People say I'm no good. Growing up in prison, Charlie had less of a chance to be exposed to positive role models. It appears they were heavily lacking in his life. He was also greatly institutionalized and had no clue how to properly survive in the real world, or at least without committing crimes. Even when he tried his best to be on the straight and narrow, he would eventually break the law and get sent back to prison. This could be in part due to Charlie's immense desire to break the rules and defy authority, since he was a diagnosed sociopath. Rebellion and disregard for authority were always two constants in his life. Charlie was severely neglected in childhood. His father abandoned him. Congressman John Duncan Jr. has been quoted as saying, Well over 90% of felony cases all over the nation are committed by defendants who grew up in father-absent households. I am unsure how true that is, but it appears to be true of Charlie. He suffered from a lot of anxiety, but was also an egomaniac. He had an amazing skill for emotionally controlling people, which he most likely learned in his childhood to survive. Charlie was left to fend for himself, and what began as a boy doing whatever he could to survive turned into a man committing crimes with no regard for anyone but himself. He resented that social services never saved him from his abusive mother, and he resented that he grew up in the system. Yet, he continued to commit crimes to end up there. They say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. When Charlie was sent to the National Training School for Boys in Washington, D.C., he was evaluated and results showed he had an IQ of 109. He was also evaluated for psychological problems and deemed to be aggressively antisocial. This meant they thought Charlie could be prone to violence and suffered from antisocial personality disorder, or most well known as sociopathy. ASPD is a personality disorder characterized by a long-term pattern of disregard for or violation of the rights of others, as well as difficulty sustaining long-term relationships. Antisocial behaviors can be both hostile and aggressive. Charlie was diagnosed as aggressive ASPD. 
Antisocial behavior thought to be aggressive include rule breaking, lying, cheating, defying authority, engaging in reckless behaviors, and having a total disregard for other people. The exact cause is not known. Genetics, parenting, and childhood traumatic experience may play a role. Commonly observed symptoms are disregard of what is right or wrong and being highly aggressive and deceitful. Antisocial personality disorder is difficult to treat, but in few cases, treatment and follow-up can be beneficial. Recommended treatment options are psychotherapy and medication. Charlie's ability to be charismatic and friendly on the outside, but evil and sociopathic on the inside, made him a dangerous force. That meant people saw him as a good person when he had nefarious intentions. Dysfunctional families are often a big part of why some people develop antisocial behaviors. The dysfunction develops due to relationship patterns that use fear or coercion to get things done. Children in this environment develop poor emotional regulation, impacting their cognition. Kids can also learn these behaviors from school or exposure to community violence. Charlie's schooling occurred mainly in schools for children who were juvenile delinquents. He most likely picked up certain behaviors from his peers. At home, he was often neglected and left to fend for himself, meaning he pretty much raised himself on his own. This might have also put Charlie in fight or flight mode at all times, which could explain why he was impacted so poorly by his childhood environment as well. Genetic factors, including environment while in utero, can also play a role. Maternal drug use and other trauma endured while in utero can also lead to a higher likelihood of developing these behaviors. It's believed that some are predisposed to antisocial behaviors due to the large impact of genetics on the structure of the brain. We are unsure if Charlie's mother was an alcoholic when she carried him. If she was, he could also face some fetal alcohol syndrome, although never diagnosed. However, we can speculate he most likely has a predisposition based on his parents' addictive behavior. If one or both parents has a history of antisocial behavior, there's a higher chance that the child will develop it as well. If parents have mental health issues, children have a higher risk of experiencing them too. Parent drug and alcohol abuse, instability in the home, child abuse, and parental inconsistencies are additional risk factors. All of these Charlie experienced. Also, we are unaware if either of his parents suffered from ASPD, but it is very possible based on their behavior. His parents did, however, suffer from addiction and that could have played a factor in Charlie taking drugs himself later on in life. Studies have proven that children who grow up in a home with parents who are addicts have a higher chance of becoming addicts themselves. Antisocial behavior is dangerous. Charlie also turned out to be dangerous. Are you guilty of plotting any murders? I killed a chicken once. Any and human being? No, no. You're absolutely innocent of any conspiracy to uh, commit murder or telling anyone to commit murder or planning it? I'll plead guilty to the Indians. Always is always forever. Is one, is one, is one. Inside yourself or your father. Always love, always love, always love. Is one. to talk, I love behind you. Illusion has been just a dream. Charlie has all the fear. It was, it was a trip. <laughs> it was a real trip. One time we was on a trip, an acid trip, and it was pretty high, and he just, he just jumped up and just jumped on top of me and just started choking me. And this really freaked me out. And he just choked me and 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 choked me. And pretty soon I realized that I was going to die. And then I thought it was okay. If I died anyway. 
Soon after his release from prison on March 22, 1967, Charlie began attracting followers in the San Francisco area. The group consisted of about 100 followers who lived in an unconventional lifestyle with habitual use of hallucinogenic drugs such as LSD. Most were young women from middle-class backgrounds, many of whom were radicalized by Manson's teachings and drawn by hippie culture and communal living. According to group member Susan Atkins, the member of the family were convinced that Charlie was a manifestation of Jesus Christ and believed in his prophecies concerning an imminent apocalyptic race war. Charlie moved to San Francisco, where, with the help of a prison acquaintance, he moved into an apartment in Berkeley. In prison, bank robber Alvin Karpis had taught Charlie to play the steel guitar. Living mostly by begging, he soon became acquainted with Mary Brunner, a 23-year-old graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Mary was working as a library assistant at the University of California, Berkeley, and Charlie moved in with her. According to a second-hand account, he overcame her resistance to his bringing other women in to live with them. I guess Mary wasn't too fond of the idea that she would have to share her man with other women. Before long, they were sharing Mary's residence, though, with 18 other women. And this is where the cult that would be known as the Manson family originally began to form. Charlie established himself as a guru in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district, which during 1967 Summer of Love was emerging as the signature hippie locale. Charlie may have borrowed some of his philosophy from the processed church of the Final Judgment, whose members believed Satan would become reconciled to Jesus and they would come together at the end of the world to judge humanity. Wonder how he thought they'd judge him. Charlie allegedly taught his followers that they were the reincarnation of the original Christians and that the Romans were the establishment. Sometime around 1967, he began using the alias Charles Willis Manson. So, from now on in this video, we shall refer to him as Charles, well, Charles or Manson. <laughs> Before the end of the summer, Charles and some of the women piled into an old school bus they had redesigned in a hippie style with colored rugs and pillows in place of the many seats they had removed. They traveled and eventually settled in the Los Angeles areas of Topanga Canyon, Malibu, and Venice. In 1967, Mary became pregnant by Manson and on the 15th of April in 1968, she gave birth to a son she named Valentine Michael. She gave birth to him in a condemned house in Topanga Canyon and she was assisted during the birth by several of the young women from the family and there were no midwives. Mary, like most members of the group, acquired a number of aliases and nicknames including Mary Ock, Auk, Mother Mary, Mary Manson, Linda D. Manson, and Christine Mary Ooch. I don't know where they got Linda and Christine from, but okay. Actor Al Lewis had Manson babysit his children, not something I would have recommended, on a couple of occasions and described him as a nice guy when I knew him. Music producer Phil Kaufman introduced Manson to Universal Studios producer Gary Stromberg, then working on a film adaption of The Life of Jesus set in modern America, featuring a black Jesus and southern redneck Romans. Stromberg thought that Manson made interesting suggestions about what Jesus might do in a situation, seeming to be attuned to the role. He had one of his women kiss his feet and then kiss hers in return to demonstrate the place of women. Sounds pretty misogynistic and cringe, if you ask me. At the beach one day, Stromberg watched while Manson preached against a materialistic outlook, only to be questioned about his well-furnished bus. He casually tossed the bus keys to the doubter, who promptly drove it away while Manson watched, apparently unconcerned. According to Stromberg, Manson had a dynamic personality with an ability to read a person's weaknesses and manipulate them. For example, Manson tried to manipulate Danny DiCarlo, the treasure of the Straight Satan's Motorcycle Club, by granting him access to family women. Mm -hmm. He then convinced DiCarlo that it was his large pee-pee which kept the women in the group. 
Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, one of my favorite groups, picked up Patricia Krenwinkel and Ella Jo Bailey when they were hitchhiking in late spring of 1968, well under the influence of alcohol and LSD, and brought them to his Pacific Palisades house for a few hours. He returned home in the early hours of the following morning from a night recording session and was greeted by Manson in the driveway, who emerged from the house. Wilson asked the stranger whether he intended to hurt him. Manson assured him that he had no such intent and began kissing Wilson's feet. Inside the house, there were 12 strangers, mostly women, just kind of hanging out there. The account given in Manson in his own words is that Manson first met Wilson at a friend's San Francisco house where Manson had gone to obtain marijuana. Manson claimed that Wilson gave him his Sunset Boulevard address and invited him to stop by when he came to Los Angeles. Wilson said in a 1968 Record Mirror article that he mentioned the Beach Boys' involvement with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi to a group of strange women and they told me they too had a guru, a guy named Charlie. The number of women doubled in Wilson's house over the next few months and they cost him approximately $100,000 by making themselves part of his household. This included a large medical bill for treatment of their uh, gonorrhea and $21,000 for the destruction of his uninsured car, which they borrowed. Wilson would sing and talk with Charlie while the women were treated as servants to them both. Wilson paid for studio time to record songs written and performed by Manson and introduced him to entertainment business acquaintances, including Greg Jacobson, Terry Melcher, and... Rudy Altobelli, who owned a house which he rented to actress Sharon Tate and her husband, Roman Polanski. Jacobson was impressed by the whole Charlie Manson package of artist, lifestylist, and philosopher, and he paid to record his material. Wilson moved out of his rented home when the lease expired, and his landlord ended up having to evict the family. Manson established a base for the family at the Spawn Ranch in August of 1968 after they were all evicted from Dennis Wilson's house. It had been a television and movie set for westerns, but the building had deteriorated by the late 1960s and the ranch's revenue was mainly derived from selling horseback rides. Female family members did chores around the ranch, I mean men didn't do anything in this cult, and occasionally had sex on Manson's orders with the nearly blind 80-year-old owner, George Spawn. The women also acted as seeing eye guides for him. In exchange, Spawn allowed Manson and his group to live at the ranch for free. Lynette Frum acquired the nickname Squeaky because she often squeaked when Spawn pinched her thigh. Lovely. Charles Watson, a small-town Texan who had quit college and moved to California, soon joined the group at the ranch. The ranch ended up burning down during a Southern California wildfire in September of 1970. It's very easy for us to look back at this and realize when the cult began to form and really wish that Dennis Wilson did not allow them to stay in his household to continue to form the Manson family cult. But we also have to consider the fact that Charlie Manson made himself out to be a guru and a philosopher, was charismatic, apparently good looking, and everyone seemed to trust him that he met. Wilson had no clue what this was going to turn into. In fact, nobody did. Nobody knew what was going to happen in the summer of 1969.
year was 1969, and a new summer of love was occurring. The summer of love was a social phenomenon that occurred during the summer of 1967, when as many as 100,000 people, mostly young people, sporting hippie fashions of dress and behavior, converged in San Francisco's neighborhood of Haight-Ashbury. More broadly, the summer of love encompassed the hippie music, hallucinogenic drugs, anti-war, and free love scene throughout the west coast of the United States and as far away as New York City. Hippies, sometimes called flower children, were a neglected group. Many were suspicious of the government, rejected consumerist values, and generally opposed the Vietnam War. A few were interested in politics. Others were concerned more with art, music, painting, and poetry in particular, or in spiritual and meditative practices. Manson, being the guru he pretended to be, had fit right into this scene, and with his steel guitar and charm, he created a large cult following, later called the Manson Family, and they took up residence at the Spawn Ranch. For a couple years, the group had a pretty low profile, although people were beginning to notice Manson was a so-called hippie guru with a major cult following, and Spawn Ranch was their compound. The first human landing on the moon wasn't the only major story to generate big headlines in the summer of 1969. The New York Jets won Super Bowl III in January. On May 23rd, the British band The Who released the double album rock opera Tommy, which featured songs like Pinball Wizard. On June 8th, President Nixon announced the withdrawal of 25,000 U.S. troops from Vietnam. On July 7th, the anti-war song by John Lennon, performed with his wife Yoko Ono, is released by the Plastic Ono Band in the U.S. It is Lennon's first solo single while a member of the Beatles. It became an anthem of protests against the Vietnam War. The Woodstock Music Festival began on August 15, 1969 in Bethel, New York. Billed as Three Days of Peace and Music, the epic event became synonymous with the counterculture movement of the 1960s. This counterculture movement was also called the Summer of Love 1969. However, Manson had something else planned for the summer of 1969, and it also involved the band The Beatles, my most favorite band. He was also a large Beatles fan, and later, members of the group claimed he played the song Helter Skelter on repeat and claimed it was telling him to start a race war. As I stated earlier, in 1967, Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys introduced Manson to record producer Terry Melcher the son of actress Doris Day. After initially showing interest in Manson's music, Melcher declined to work with him further. He later claimed he didn't find Manson to be that talented. Melcher later moved out of his home on Cielo Drive, and the house was then leased to film director Roman Polanski and his wife, actress Sharon Tate. Sharon Marie Tate Polanski was born on January 24, 1943. She was an American actress and model. During the 1960s, she played small television roles before appearing in films and was regularly featured in fashion magazines as a model and cover girl. She was beautiful. After receiving positive reviews of her comedic and dramatic acting performances, Sharon Tate was hailed as one of Hollywood's most promising newcomers. She made her film debut in 1961 as an extra in Barabbas. She next appeared in the horror film Eye of the Devil in 1966. Her most remembered performance, though, was as Jennifer North in the 1967 cult classic film Valley of the Dolls, which earned her a Golden Globe Award nomination. That same year, she also performed in the film The Fearless Vampire Killers, and that was directed by her future husband, Roman Polanski. 
In late 1967, Tate and Polanski returned to London and were frequent subjects of newspaper and magazine articles. She was depicted as being untraditional and modern and was quoted as saying that couples should live together before marrying. That was unheard of at that time. Tate and Polanski were married in Chelsea, London on January 20th, 1968 with considerable publicity. She became pregnant near the end of 1968, and she and Polanski moved to Cielo Drive on February 15, 1969. Tate was encouraged by the positive reviews of her comedic performances and chose the comedy 12 Plus One as her next project, largely for the opportunity to co-star with Orson Welles. In March of 1969, she traveled to Italy to begin filming, and Polanski went to London to work on The Day of the Dolphin. Writer Warczyk Frakowski, coffee hieress Abigail Folger, moved into the Cielo Drive house. After completing 12 Plus One, Cher enjoyed Roman in London. She posed in their apartment for photographer Terry O'Neill in casual domestic scenes such as opening baby gifts, and she completed a series of glamour photographs for the British magazine Queen. She returned from London to Los Angeles on July 20th, 1969 on the Queen Elizabeth II. Polanski was due to return on August 12th in time for the birth of their child and he had asked Rakowski and Folger to stay in the house with his wife until he returned. They were going to help take care of her while she was very pregnant. In July of 1969, Gary Hedman was killed by a Manson family member, Bobby Busolet, accompanied by Manson family members Mary Brunner and Susan Atkins. The murder was committed at the command of Charlie. On August 8, 1969, also at Manson's command, a small group of his followers brutally murdered five people at the Benedict Canyon home on Cielo Drive. The victims were Polanski's pregnant wife, Sharon Tate, writer Warczyk Frakowski, coffee Harris Abigail Folger, and celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring. Also killed was Stephen Parent, who was a friend of the family's gardener. The murders were committed by Susan Atkins, Tex Watson, and Patricia Krenwinkel. Linda Casabian had gone along to be their lookout. The group had written the word pigs on the door and misspelt the song Helter Skelter, adding an A as well. The words were written in the victim's blood. On August 9, 1969, Manson, displeased at the sloppiness of the previous night's murders, accompanied a group of followers on a search for new victims. In the car were Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkel, Cassabian, Leslie Van Houten, and Steve Grogan, also known as Clem. After several hours, the group comes upon the house of supermarket executive Leno LaBianca and his wife Rosemary. The couple are brutally murdered by Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Van Houten. It is said that Manson may have mistaken this home as still being the home of Melcher, and he wanted revenge on him for not enjoying his music and meeting up with him as promised. Manson family members also claimed they wrote the words on the walls to start a race war. Apparently, before committing the murders, Manson told the group, do something witchy. If you're going to do something, do it well. And leave something witchy. Leave a sign to let the world know that you were there. Have a good day. In October of 1969, Manson and his followers committed auto theft and were arrested at another remote location called Barker Ranch. On November 6, 1969, Susan Atkins, already charged in the murder of Hinman, tells inmate Virginia Castro that she killed Tate because we wanted to do a crime that would shock the world, that the world would have to stand up and take notice. On November 12, 1969, L.A. Sheriff's detectives interview Al Springer, a motorcycle gang member who had some association with Charlie. 
Springer tells them that Charlie told him about killing people days after the Tate murders. On November 18, 1969, Deputy District Attorney Vincent T. Bugliosi is assigned the case. And on November 30th, Watson was apprehended in Texas. It wasn't until December 8th of 1969 that Manson, Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Cassabian are indicted for the murders of Tate and her friends. The grand jury also indicts the five plus Van Houten for the LaBianca murders. After the murders, Polanski said he began to suspect various friends and associates and his paranoia subsided only when the killers were arrested. Newspapers claimed that many Hollywood stars were moving out of the city, while others installed security systems in their homes. Dominic Dunn recalled the tension. The shockwaves that went through the town were beyond anything I had ever seen before. People were convinced that the rich and famous of the community were in peril. Children were sent out of town. Guards were hired. Steve McQueen packed a gun when he went to Jay Sebring's funeral. Roman Polanski gave away all of his possessions after the murders, unable to bear any reminders of the period that he called the happiest I ever was in my life. He remained in Los Angeles until the killers were arrested. His 1979 film, Tess, was dedicated to Sharon, as Tate had read Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles during her final stay with Polanski in London and had left it for him to read, with the comment that it would be a good story for them to film together. He tried to explain his anguish after the murder of his wife and unborn son in his 1984 autobiography, Roman by Polanski, saying, since Sharon's death, and despite appearances to the contrary, my enjoyment of life has been incomplete. In moments of unbearable personal tragedy, some people find solace in religion. In my case, the opposite happened. Any religious faith I had was shattered by Sharon's murder. It reinforced my faith in the absurd. In July of 2005, Polanski successfully sued Vanity Fair magazine for libel after it alleged that he had tried to seduce a woman on his way to Tate's funeral. Among the witnesses who testified on his behalf were Deborah Tate and Mia Farrow. Describing Polanski in media after Tate's death, Mia Farrow testified, Of this I can be sure, of his frame of mind when we were there, of what we talked about, of his utter sense of loss, of despair, and bewilderment and shock and love, a love that he had lost. At the conclusion of the case, Polanski read a statement saying in part, The memory of my late wife Sharon Tate was at the forefront of my mind in bringing this action. The murders committed by the Manson family have been described by social commentators as one of the defining moments of the 1960s. Joan Didion wrote, Many people I know in Los Angeles believe that the 60s ended abruptly on August 9, 1969, ended at the exact moment when the word of the murders on Cielo Drive traveled like brush fire through the community, and in a sense, this is true. The tension broke that day. The paranoia was fulfilled. The Manson family murders had officially ended the hippie.